It's good to be in the house of the Lord. And I tell you, it's good to be able to get up and come to the house of the Lord. Amen. There's a lot of folks with desire to be here, but they can't be here because they're not able to. And uh, I tell you, we need to pray for them. There's some folks that are able but aren't here. We need to pray for them just as just as hard and just as bad for them because they're in a dangerous state. Uh, I always love coming to be with God's people. <coughs> gathering around the Word of God and seeing what God has for us. Uh, I ask that you just uh, pray for me tonight. And... Uh, let everybody have an open mind, an open heart tonight. Let the Holy Spirit just have His way with us tonight. If you will, in your Bible, turn to Philippians chapter number uh, 1. Philippians chapter number 1. It's going to take some verses of Scripture out of chapter 1 and chapter 2. Uh, if you like writing in your Bibles, titles, or just writing notes down, you can write this down, not in part but the whole. Not in part, but the whole. You know, we, the majority of the people who are saved uh, in our local Bible-believing churches now are, they're saved and saved forever, but they're not living it in the whole, are they? Uh, they think that they can be saved and live like the world. Well, they're, they're living a defeated life is what they're, they're living. Uh, they don't know what the joy of, of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is. They don't know what true happiness is. They're, they're trying to find these things, an imitation of it in the world, and they're not, never going to find it. We look at the Apostle Paul here, and uh, as he's writing some letters to... The people in Philippi. And Paul himself has went through great suffering for the cause of Christ. Now I don't believe Paul would be the one today, that if he was in our churches today, that you could come and give him some lame excuse why we ain't serving God like we need to. I'd say our modern churches would probably make the Apostle Paul sick. With all the modern conveniences at our hand, we can make some excuse why we can't serve God the way we need to. And I, can I say this? If you're looking for an excuse not to serve God, you will find an excuse not to serve God. Have you ever noticed when you wake up in the morning, on a Sunday morning, you just don't feel like you just want to do anything? You might have worked hard all week. It don't take long till you can find an excuse to stay in that bed and miss church. You can even get yourself to the place where you've got a headache that morning and you need to stay in bed. You can say, well, my stomach hurts. And you can get yourself convinced that you've got this stomach ache and you can stay in bed. A lot of things we can use for excuses. We're going to look a little bit here, not in part, but the whole. I tell you, I love reading the letter that Paul wrote to the Philippians there. I'm just going to read part of that. Just starting in verse 9 of chapter 1, it says, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more, and, and more in knowledge and in, in all judgment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. I just stop there for a minute. I don't want to do anything in my Christian walk to be an offense to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to hold the line and, and do what God called me to do until Jesus comes and takes me out of here. I don't want to be an offense to my church, to my family, or to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is easy to get to the point where you can be. Amen? Through our excuses. The Apostle Paul keeps writing, he says, but filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and the praise of God. But I would ye, I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in the palaces and in all other places. You know, the Apostle Paul is 
went through a lot of things, been beaten, shipwrecked, uh, left for dead, stoned. Look at the things that Paul happened to the Apostle Paul just in his walk for the Lord Jesus Christ. Most of us would have quit a long time ago. Most of us would have threw in the towel a long time ago. We're just not going to put up with this much trouble or go through this much trouble for any cause whatsoever. But Paul stuck it out Amen. just for one reason. Not for his name to be in lights, not to be recognized a man, but for the furtherance of the gospel Amen. of Jesus Christ. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer right here. Our, our Heavenly Father, we ask for your help. We ask that you clear our minds and our hearts and our souls here tonight. We need to focus upon you, dear Lord. We ask, Lord, that you speak to every mind and heart and soul here. Lord, I know that we all need a fresh touch. I know that we all could be closer to walk with you. I know every bit of this because I know it within myself. Help me, dear Lord, be what I should be for your glory and your honor. Remove me out of the way and speak to every heart here tonight. We need you, dear Lord. I, I don't know, it could be folks here that are lost, and if the Lord would take them out, or if death would come and knock, and they would burn eternity in a place called hell. And Lord, you've done everything possible to keep them from going there. Help us, Lord. Help them. <coughs> Open our minds and hearts, and we'll give you the glory and praise. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You know, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe, set the pattern for our lives. Would you say, would you agree with that? Yeah. As he walked upon the earth, he was faced with the exact same things that every one of us is faced with. He was faced with all the problems and trials and tribulations that we was faced with. And he set the pattern. Now, he was 100% man, but he was 100% God, and he didn't sin. We was born a sinner. We can't live a sinless life. Can't do it. But you know, the, uh, Jesus set that pattern for us. He, he loved people that didn't love him. Amen. He forgave people that would not never forgive him. He never said, uh, uh, turned a false word toward anybody. Even those who brought the harm and, and death upon him, he was still concerned about their souls to the very end. He set the pattern for our lives. Can I say this? The world should not set the pattern for a child of God's life. What the world does, we should not be doing. Amen? What the world says, we should not be saying. The places that the world go, we should not be going. This is part of that separation process that God put us through. But I'm afraid that most of us here tonight are letting the world set the pattern for our lives. We'll let things such as circumstances and situations set the pattern for us. Who can stand up here tonight with all honesty and say, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt I will not get sick this coming year. I don't believe there's a person here with the right mind can stand up and say that. Who here tonight can say, I'm in such control that nobody in my family will die this year in my family. Is anybody here willing to stand up and say that? Well, nobody died last year. I'm in good shape. Yeah, but that's just, you going to play that hand again this year? You're going to stand before God and say, nobody will die around me. i got that much power. There ain't nobody here in their right mind can stand up and say that. Can anybody here this year would stand up and say, uh, I won't worry about not one thing. I won't take a worry about nothing. I don't think we can. If you've got kids, you've got children, you've got a job, you've got things going, you're going to worry about something. Amen. I don't think none of us could do that. The Apostle Paul wasn't promising these people down in Philippi that it was going to be an easy walk. Amen. He never promised them this. The Apostle Paul was being pounded on every side, but he kept pushing for Jesus Christ. Paul stand, he was standing upon his love for Jesus is what he was standing upon. You can read this over in chapter, in, in chapter 1, verse uh, 21. I believe this breaks down exactly the way Paul felt about Christ. He said, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. He said, if I'm here on this earth, it's going to be all about Christ. 
And if I die, I'm going to be with Christ. This is his mindset. That he, can we say us as children of God here has this same kind of mindset? That we're going to, if we're going to live on this earth, it's going to be all about Christ. If we, if we say, well, if I'm going to die, I'm going to be with Christ. Or, or, can we have that same kind of comfort? Paul had some comfort here, I, I believe. Yeah. But you know, the Apostle Paul, he, he kept writing to these people down in Philippi. Yeah. And, and, and the first thing I want to look at is the reasons for a living for Christ. Our reason. Do you have a reason why you should live for Christ? It's surrounded in your life somewhere. Can you look yourself in the mirror and say, the reason I'm going to live for Christ? And can you point out one thing? The reason why you would live for Christ here tonight, can you? Can you name one thing that you, you're going to completely sell out, completely uh, uh, no doubt whatsoever that you can say, this is the reason why I live for Christ. Can you look in the mirror and say, it's because I love Him with all my heart is the reason I'm living for Christ. Can we say that? Just asking. No one's promised this rose garden. Nobody's promised an easy walk. Things are going to happen in our life that we have no control over. We can either let it crumble us and, and sweep us away, or we can take a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's telling them in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, If there be man, can you imagine that? If there be any consolation in Christ. He said, If, if, there's, if, there's, going to, if there's any Wisdom, if there's any hope, if there's any comfort I can have in knowing who the Lord Jesus Christ is, why should I even go through it? Remember now, Paul's done been through the, whole, the meal. He's done been beaten. He's done been through these things. He, he's done, he, Paul's body bears the marks of Jesus Christ on the outside and on the inside. Amen? We're not marked up on the outside too bad yet, are we? We haven't been beaten for the cause of Christ. Now, we might have been smeared at and looked at wrong. and We might have had some people talk about us, but uh, whoopee, you know. We're not bleeding. We're not, we're not cut up. And, and we're not next to death. We're not left for dead. We haven't been this for the cause of Christ. This man, Paul, has been. And he's looking at the people down in Philippi. He said, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ... It's there, folks. If there be any, if there be any consolation, Christ. If there be any comfort in love, we can live uh, reasons for living a godly life because we do have wisdom that who Jesus Christ is. Holy Spirit gives us to us, don't He? Yeah. You know that word consolation. You ever look at that? You ever consult somebody? What do you do when you consult somebody? That means you're going to talk to somebody that knows more about something than you. Is that kind of what that means? If you want to consult somebody about your finances, you go to talk to somebody who can handle finances, who knows finances, and can look at your financial state and say, this is what you need to do to get lined out. You know what you do when you consult somebody? You're asking for some wisdom on how to get through some hard times. Hey, Paul's saying if, there, if there's any consolation, we've got somebody who's got some wisdom can help us through troubled times. And when you console somebody, what does that mean? Now, these are all derived out of the same word right here. When you console somebody, you bring a great comfort to them, aren't you? But if there's any time that we live today and a time of toil and stress all around us as we see our nation crumbling, as we see morality crumbling all around us, we need a time and a place where we can get some wisdom from somebody who knows a whole lot more than me and you. We need to go someplace where we can get some comfort outside of the things of the world. And that's where we get it out of the Word of God. When God speaks directly to our hearts and brings comfort to our souls. Do you read your Bible? If you don't, you ain't got no comfort in your heart. I can't bring comfort to you. You can't bring comfort to me. Now, we, we can help one another, but true comfort and wisdom is going to come through the Word of God. If you're not reading your Bible, you're not getting a whole lot, are you? He says, if there be any comfort of love. 
Boy, I'm going to ask you right now. We need to park right there for uh, for the, uh, for just a second. Uh, how many of you here uh, uh, have been beside somebody dying uh, in the de on the deathbed there, and they're saved, uh, and you look at them, and you see the peace and calmness in their heart? Have you ever been there? There is such a great comfort of just knowing who the Lord Jesus Christ is and knowing that He is mine and I am His. There's great comfort in that. I don't care what happens to this body. I don't care what happens around us. Tragedy can hit on every side. The Apostle Paul can tell you, if you want to sit down and talk about misery, I say Paul's a man you need to talk to. If you want to talk about somebody done you wrong, pull up a chair and talk to Paul a while. He knows what it's all about. But Paul's telling him down in Philippi, I know where you can get some wisdom. I know where you can get some comfort. And I know where you can get a hold of somebody that loves you uncircumstanced. No circumstance attached. He'll love you. He died for you. Boy, I'm telling you, that's great love right there. I love a lot of you folks, but I don't know if I'd die for you. I don't know if you'd die for me. When it comes down to nitty gritty, would you? Christ said, I'll do it. Didn't blink an eye as he died. He said, listen here, if any fellowship of the Spirit, do you know who the Lord Jesus Christ is? If you know him and accept him, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. There ain't no doubt about it. There ain't, oh, I ain't got no Holy Spirit in me. You get saved, you have the Holy Spirit in you. And I got great comfort within me and great fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit tells me what's right and what's wrong, what I should do, what I should say. It's up to me to obey the Spirit. Amen. Amen. My flesh, I'm going to say this, my flesh is not going to obey the Spirit. My flesh fights the Spirit because it goes completely contrary what the Spirit wants me to do. The flesh wants me to, to get fleshy and get mouthy and get nasty and get raunchy. The Spirit says you need to abstain from these. You need to step away from these things. You need to pray about these things. You need to get back away and flee from them things because you're going to get yourself in trouble if you let the flesh dictate instead of the Spirit. Paul's giving us reasons why we need to be living for Christ. You know, he says, he says right here, fellowship with the Spirit. He says, if there's any, if there's any bowels of mercy, if there's any bowels of mercy whatsoever, bowels means tender hearted or tenderness and mercy. Do you, let me ask you this. Have you got much mercy from the world? Have you got any tenderness from the world? Have you? Can you go out in the world, in the worldly place? Let me ask you, can you go down to the old local bar down here with your heart ripped out and stomped in the floor? Can you find any tenderness down there that's going to help you? I don't believe you're going to get it out of no bottle. I don't believe you're going to get it out of no pill. You might hide it and cover it up for just a little bit, but then as soon as that starts wearing down, that problem sits right there pounding on you. I know a place where you can go. And you can find the tenderness and mercy that you could ever obtain as through the Lord Jesus Christ. See, I don't know your heart tonight. You don't know my heart tonight. I don't know the vile things that go through your mind. You don't know the vile things that go through my mind. But I tell you somebody who does. <laughs> The Lord Jesus Christ does. He knows what you look at. He knows what you listen to. He knows what's driving your, your mind tonight. He, he knows all these things, and yet He still loves you, and yet He still wants to have this tender mercy placed upon you, and He wants to give it to you right now. At our very bad, at our worst, Christ loves us the same. Can you believe that? That's, I, can't, I can't understand that. At my very worst, He still loves me the most. His love never changes. When I'm right with Him and praying and seeking His face, that love is so great. But when I turn my back on Him and reject Him, and His, well, His love is still hasn't changed. He still loves me the same. So you can't use being in the flesh as an excuse. Because Paul tells us right here. Betty, you got to live for Christ. you got to push for Christ. You can't use things as, as situations, circumstances to bring you down where you can't fulfill your obligations of Christ. Because he says, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if there be any comfort of love, if there be any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, 
that the Lord has put in us, we cannot stop and quit pushing for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look at the pattern for living for Christ. Now, he, he gives us a reason to live for Christ, but he gives us a pattern. Boy, people don't like these, these examples that Christ gives us. Now, verse 2, chapter 2 says, it says right here, fulfill you my joy. Now, what's that mean right there? The Apostle Paul was in prison, and the Apostle Paul had been beaten, the Apostle Paul had been left for dead, and, and if you read his life, he'd been shipwrecked, and, and all these things happened to the Apostle Paul. And, and you know, he could say, you know, you, won't you buy me a nice house, and that would bring great joy to me. Won't you go down there and buy me uh, a, a huge uh, uh, garments and, and an array that I can wear around? That'll bring great. No, that's not what's going to bring great joy to Paul. Paul said, fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded. Like-minded. Well, how in the world can you take this many people and be like-minded? How can you take this many Baptists and be like-minded in anything? Amen? You know why we have, because everybody's got their own opinion about things. Paul's saying we need to be like-minded, and like-minded means our mind likened unto Jesus Christ. Uh, the same methods that Jesus used, we should be used. The same mindset that Jesus had, we should have. Amen? And it's all about pushing and driving to the lost souls, dying and going to hell, and bringing them to Jesus Christ, and telling them how to get saved. Like-mindedness. Paul said, you want to break great joy to my heart? That you be like-minded. They don't stop there. Have, having the same love. <clears throat> having the same love. What love? What love could he be possibly talking about? The love of Christ that instilled each and every one of us. That love. The same love. Yeah. Did you ever see Jesus not forgive anybody? Did you ever see Jesus uh, uh, when they, they slapped him, when they, they cussed him, they talked bad about him? Did you see him turn his back on them folks? If I can remember off the cross, he looked down and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's the type of, of uh, uh, the, the mindset that we need to have. And that's the same love that we should have for one another. Boy, don't stop there. And I tell you, we don't like when we get these patterns for living for Christ, do we? Being of one accord. Man. Don't stop there. One accord of one mind. What do you think this church is here for? What, what, does anybody have? Well, we, we, we gather up there and they just want our money. Is that what you think the church is for? You think the church is just to gather around here so we can sing some songs? It gives me a place to sing my songs. Yeah. Well, it gives a place for my kids to go play. Yeah. Get them out of my hair. Is, is that what church is, this church is for? Paul's main life and goal was uplifting and magnifying the Lord Jesus Christ. He was willing to let his body be a sacrifice for that to get done. Whatever it took, the Lord, whatever it's going to take for your name to be uplifted and magnified, I'm here. I won't say no. I won't reject you. I'm going to say, Lord, here it is. Bring it on. I would say that if Paul's flesh got a hold of Paul, when they entered into the the town, he, he would probably look at Silas that day and say, Silas, just, just keep your mouth shut. I'm sick of tired of going to jail. They just feed the scraps down there. I, I tell you, I, I, it's affecting my breathing and I can't breathe like I need to. It, it's going to uh, pneumonia and the emphysema of them old damp uh, jail cells and tear me up. Just, let's just keep our mouth shut and let's just flow through the town and let's just do what we need to do. Let's go find some people that really like us and let's gather around with them and talk to them and not talk to these other folks. So that's what churches is tied up in now. They only want to knock on the doors of the brick homes. They only want to knock on the doors of the big communities. They don't want to go down to the slums. And they don't want to go down where the drug houses are, where the little kids are dirty and playing in the street. They don't want those kids. They want the ones 
from the brick houses. God help us if we ever get to the point where we're trying to divide and pick and choose who needs to come in our church. God help us if we ever get to the point and get so high thinking that we don't need these people in our church. Yeah. You ever, I think Harmon said one time, if we get one of these big high muckety muck people coming in our church, you'd fall over trying to shake his hand. I, I would say that if, if, uh, if uh, Jim Justice would walk in this church here, you'd break your neck trying to shake your hand. Stick your hand out there. Make yourself known. Welcome to our church. Thank you for coming. But you take the local drunk down the street or local dope head comes into church, you start gathering things up and pulling to the side and looking. Don't want to shake his hand because you're afraid you get your hand dirty. If we get to that shape, we're not affected for the Lord Jesus Christ. They need to be saved just like the other folks need to be saved. He sets the pattern for us to live for Christ. You know, uh, uh, being of one accord and of one mind. I believe our church needs to be set just for one reason. That's for not for, for playing games and not for, for drawing crowds. See, when people get caught up in, in drawing crowds and numbers. You know, they, they get so worked up over numbers. Sure. When that's all you're worried about is the numbers. We've missed the mark. Yeah. Amen. Well, if we get a large number in here, well, you, you missed the mark. There was a song I heard not long ago. I love that song. It talks about the lady sitting in the back of the church and, and who messed up our carpet and who did this and who did that and who moved the piano. Who did, you know, people get tied up with the building. Oh, yeah. And they get so engulfed with the building that we miss the whole purpose that the building's here for. Amen. Souls to be saved. Yeah. Lives to be changed. There's a pattern for living for Christ. And Christ set that pattern. If the world's setting your pattern, you've fallen way short. Amen. And I'm afraid, and I'm going to have to say this, I'm afraid the world is setting the pattern for the churches today. People are bringing things into their churches that should not be into a church. People are changing their, their floor mats, and, uh, changing the, uh, the Bible, and they're changing their music, and they're changing all things to appeal to the flesh, to draw crowds in. I believe if the Holy Spirit don't bring them in, we don't need them. Amen. I believe if the Holy Spirit ain't working in it, we don't need to bring the world in here to bring the people in here. People say I'm old-fashioned. I like it. Amen. Amen. The old path. And, and I would say 60 years ago, if they look at our church now, they think we're liberal. Because yeah. we got air condition. Yeah. We got padded seats. Well, I tell you, when we started getting these things is when the power of the church started leaving. Amen. 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 We can't worship God unless the temperature's right. Amen? Amen. Go ahead and shake your head. Wow. I ain't never going back here. It's too hot. Yeah. I ain't never going back here. It's too cold. Yeah. Well, let's let everybody die and go to hell till you get comfortable, all right? Yeah. This is the mindset of the church today. We're not of, of one accord and, and of one mind. We're worried about me. Yeah. Me. I got to be comfortable. I don't care about nobody else. Yeah. Boy, I tell you, if we had us a perfect setting of temperature, it'd be well worth its money. Yeah. You'll have people over here with blankets and covers and chilling like this. I ain't coming back. You got people over here with sweat running. I ain't coming back. It's too hot. Yeah. The switch is on the fans. Run back and forth. This is too hot. This is too cold. Why would they turn the fan on? Why would they turn the fan off? Won't they turn the air conditioner off? Won't they turn the heat on? It ain't never going to be perfect. If you're always cold, wear clothes to make you warm. If you're always hot, just stay hot. We don't want to see no more of your body. Amen. We need to be of one accord and of one mind. Our main function as a child of God, if you are truly saved, truly born of God and washed in the blood, our one accord should be the mindset of all souls need to be saved. We need to carry the gospel to everybody that we meet. 
and of one mind if we start bringing people into our churches that don't look exactly the way we look. They might not talk the way we talk. Let's not get critical about it. Let's pray about it and put them toward Jesus Christ. Let the Lord take care of the cleaning, not us. Amen. Pattern for living for Christ. Look at the evidence. I tell you, there's a reason for living for Christ, and there's a pattern for living for Christ. But you know what? There's going to be some evidence that we are living for Christ. Verse 3, let nothing. What's that? Nothing. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. But with the loneliness of mind... Let each esteem one better than himself. Amen. Evidence that you're living a spirit-filled life. Let me read that again in case you didn't get it. Let nothing be done through strife. What's it, strife? What is that? What strife mean? In your own mind right now, I ask you what strife meant. What does strife mean to you? He said, let nothing be done in this word called strife. I would be saying to get back at, to get even, to hurt more than you was hurt. That's what it's saying. Well, that shouldn't happen in our church. It happens in our churches. Amen. When a brother falls, people saying, goody, goody. That'll hurt him. When you should have been on the altar praying for him all the time. You've been praying with the tearful tears. When's the last time you wept for a brother or a sister in Christ that's not where they should be and they're most miserable if they ain't there? When's the last time you shed one little tear in their behalf? When's the last time you shed a, a real tear for a soul dying and going to hell? See, we don't concern ourselves with this, we block them out. We don't want to be bothered with it. It'll interrupt my Jeopardy time, my Facebook time. It'll interfere with the things of the world. I don't want to be bothered with it. Don't trouble me with it. Souls are dying and going to hell, and we do not care. Amen? To me, that's strife. <laughs> to me, that's done in strife. Vainglory. If the only thing you're doing is to be seen or to be heard, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. We're not here to perform. Amen. I'm not here to win no contest to being favorable in people's eyes. I'm not here for this. You're not here for this. Our goal here is not to be seen or heard, but to uplift and magnify the Lord Jesus Christ through our walk and through our talk. Amen. Amen. He said right there, but in loneliness of mind. What's that? What does that mean? Let each esteem others better than themselves. Loneliness of mind says, stop thinking so highly of yourself. You ain't nobody and I ain't nobody. Amen. Jesus never did that. Jesus left the portals of glory, had angels at his fingertips could speak and the, the world is in existence. The stars, he throwed them out there. The moon is out there. The sun's out there because he said go and stay till I tell you to come back. Come down here and become a servant to us. God himself become a servant to us. Came down and bare the sin debts of the world. Washed his disciples' feet. Loneliness. You know, Christ never did one time think himself better than anybody else. Never did, not one time. Although he was, he deserved more. He deserved better. He deserved all the glory and praise of all the earth. But yet he was washing the disciples' feet. We can't even bow down enough and look down at our nose at somebody enough in our arrogant ways and say, are you saved? Let me tell you how to get saved. There's evidence of living for Christ here. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also 
on the things of others. Amen. How concerned are you about other people? Are you just so engulfed with your own life that you don't worry about nobody else? Amen. I'm just would be honest tonight. God already knows your heart. He already knows if you're worried about others more than you are yourself. Just to put it right, frankly, the things we do is for ourselves. Our number one mindset is pleasing me. Amen? We ain't worried about what happens to Jeff. We ain't worried about happening to Steve or Bob or, or Danny or, or Harm. We, we hear some bad things happen. You know what we do? Oh, well. I hope they can get out of it one day. But yet you didn't shed one tear. Your heart wasn't broken for one minute. You never crossed your mind when you got out of the church. Never entered in your mind the troubles that's going on in other people's lives. You don't even hear the prayer request given in the house of God. Now I know some of them you can't hear. Some of them's low and, and you can't hear them. But you know what? You can see somebody's mouth move. You can say, Lord, they got a problem. I don't know what it is, but they got a problem. I've said it before. How many times have I said, if I'd walk down out of here and one of these days I might just do it and point my finger in the face and say, what's Bob's request? What was Lisa's request? What was Bill's request? Could you, say, could you mention one request other than yours that you've given? This is the mindset that today's church has gotten into. We're not worried about nobody else. It's all about me. Until we get to the place that the Apostle Paul was telling the church at Philippi that you need to get into. If you're ever going to be a God-blessed people, if we're ever going to have the blessings of God on our, our lives, this is what we got to do. We ever want our church to grow spiritually. I'm more concerned about our church growing spiritually Amen. than by numbers. Amen. Amen. Yeah. If we get everybody in the church right now be spirit-filled and spirit-led, we can move mountains. Amen. You could. Yeah. Boy, I'm telling you, he, this is a man that's went through the mill. This ain't a man that says, do as I say and not as I do. Paul's been through the mill. You know, he says in verse 5 of chapter 2, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Man, I, I tell you, let this mind be in you, that was in Christ Jesus. Christ was full of love and mercy and forgiveness. Christ's main goal as he walked on the earth to set the pattern was pointing toward the Father. Everything he did pointed toward the Father. Did he rebuke some people? He sure did. But he did it while pointing them to the Father. Yes. How many of you last year in 2015 gave somebody a piece of your mind? How many did that? I'm going to tell them and I'm going to set them straight. I'm going to tell them what they should know. And all along you don't know. What they should know. Amen. And really, to be honest about it, you can't afford to give nobody no more of your mind. Because if that's all you're worried about, setting somebody straight and giving them a piece of your own mind, uh, your mind ain't where it needs to be. It's a trash mind. Amen. Once you get a, a new mind, liking unto Jesus Christ, Amen. the renewing of your mind, you can get that through Jesus Christ, through the Word of God, through praying and sincere praying to God. When's the last time you cried and shed a tear for anybody else other than yourself? When's the last time you shed a tear for that son or that daughter that's going to split hell wide open? If God don't get a hold of their soul, they will die and be in hell for eternity. That would scare me to death. Got neighbors probably on the same street dying and going to hell. We ain't wasted time shedding a tear for them. Our children are going out into a world now that ain't the same world we went in 25 years ago. It ain't the same world we was in 10 years ago. 
It's an evil place. It's a place absent of Jesus Christ. Because we don't run him out of our schools. We run him out of our government. We're killing babies left and right. like it's, that's, And we do it all for money. And we think that we got something that the world needs. The world needs Jesus Christ. Amen. And I'm afraid if the America don't get a hold of Jesus Christ pretty soon, we're done for. Yes. Right. Our lives should be to serve others and not ourselves. Yeah. I believe this is our measuring stick on our own spirituality. What you're doing for others. Not what you're doing. I mean, we can pat ourselves on the back, can't we? I sing in the choir. Oh, I work in the Wannas. I drive a bus. I read my Bible once last month. I come to church twice this month. So that's what we're... I'm not doing that to be fun. This is what we do. I'm spiritual. I'm right with God. God's going to bless me and He's going to give me everything I want. Because I am somebody and I do some things for God. And all the time, you ain't worried about souls going to hell. All the time, you ain't worried about other people, but we're busy patting our backs. God's well pleased with me. But we should be so full of shame that we ain't even marked the dirt at the feet of Jesus, what we should be. Until we get rid of this pride and all this arrogancy that we have around us. And if we don't get busy uh, concerning ourselves with the things of God, we will never be anything for the Lord Jesus Christ. Bob, give us a song ready. I don't even know how you give an invitation or something like this. If you are saved, you know you're not doing what you need to do.